ఫిజికల్టేషన్ i welcome you all to this interesting webinar today's topic is really interesting topic on traumatic brain injury how to go for a neuropsychological assessment and its management as you know all know this is a neurological injury that affects cognitive emotional psychological and physical functioning many times we think about the physical part only like uh, controlling spasticity correcting deformity trying to get balance everything but the real uh, hindrance in the uh, process of tra traumatic brain injury rehabilitation is the uh, the neuro rehabilitation part so uh, as you all know we all are uh, very much acquainted with our rls scale that is rancho's level so it, though it starts from uh, no response to general response or localized response actually the real problem starts with a level 3 le level 4 and level 5 that is your uh, level 4 is confused agitated and level 5 is confused inappropriate so these are the stages where really it is a challenge to handle the patient i have seen patients admitted to the ward with so much of agitation that that is very difficult to manage in the ward and they create a very uh, i mean inappropriate atmosphere in the ward Uh, the time sometimes uh, such a things happen that the parents they are forced to discharge the patient the situation became uh, so chaotic uh, at the ward so uh, that that is the time where we have to handle that this level 4 uh, and 5 before going for any uh, physical rehabilitation so uh, uh, this 4 and 5 is really challenge for us and that need to be handled unless patient uh, the 4 and 5 is not managed patient will not be cooperative you cannot go for other modalities of management like any suspasticity management or therapy because the patient will not respond to you patient will not cooperate you so uh, today we'll discuss uh, that part and here i would like to uh, highlight here is that the approach to a management of a traumatic brain injury is always a, holistic approach where we uh, assess and treat the case of tbi as a holistic way not only only therapeutic methods also the the prime part is that the neuropsychological assessment and management so today this interesting uh, talk will be uh, presented by uh, dr uh, professor sarada prasanna swain he is currently professor of psychiatry sc medical college kotak and also he was ex director of mental health, health institute kotak so i would like to uh, he is a great academician if you look to his brief uh, uh, cb uh, he is uh, graduated and post graduated from sc medical college kotak and he is my friend and my classmate and uh, uh, he has taken the charge of uh, professor uh department of psychiatry from 2018 uh, his academic skill is well visible by his uh, number of presentation he has presented published 44 publications in index journal and uh, he was the president of uh, uh, uh indian uh, psychiatric society odisha state branch 2015 to 2016 and he was the editor of odisha journal of psychiatry from uh 2006 to 2016 10 years and he has got many awards and recognitions he is the member of national disaster management authority government of india and he and has he... authored so, some books also i have gone through one of his book on patient awareness regarding this uh, neurological uh, psychiatric management part and assessment part so uh, let us welcome Dr. Sarada Prasanna Swain 
uh, he uh, and will invite him to present a talk on management of behavioral issues uh, in neuro rehabilitation, especially uh, in traumatic brain injury. Welcome to uh, Professor Dr. Sarada Prasad Pai. Over to you. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Am I audible? <clears throat> Yes, yes, we are audible. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pavitra. Uh, um, uh, I think first uh, I beg a pardon that uh, uh, because of my hectic schedule, although he has requested me many times, unfortunately, because of the hectic activities in my professional life, I was unable to deliver the lecture since a long. But lastly, it was possible today. So a very good evening to all the all my colleagues, those who are in the uh, webinar. So today, uh, very, very, very interesting topic that is management of uh, behavioral disorders in neuro rehabilitation. As you know, uh, in the recent times, because of the large scale, uh, large scale, there is a great number of uh, accidents especially the road traffic accidents causing, causing the traumatic brain injury. Anybody can see the neurosurgery department of SV Medical College where you will see the pupils or the patients are there, not in the bed, but at least 100%, 100 patients every time, each and every day in the floor or in the baranda. This indicates the, the gravity of the traumatic brain injury because of the road traffic accident or, or because of any injury. So today, especially we will concentrate on the behavioral issues, especially after the TBA. So first, we will discuss in this context, the how the TBI occurs and what is, uh, how we will do the, the approach to a patient of TBI how we will do the neuropsychiatry evaluation, then how we will manage the behavioral issues. So first, coming to the main topic, uh, the outline of why behavioral issues are most important in the neuro rehabilitation. As you know, neuro rehabilitation is not a single standard approach. It is a multi-dimensional approach by when the patient of TBI after the road traffic accident is admitted in the neurosurgery ward, after the patient is partially recovered from the neurosurgery ward or from the surgery ward, there starts the rehabilitation process. In the rehabilitation process, the especially the department of PMR, which is a evolving, evolving science in our country, India, that is uh, your uh, that is your department that take the major part but simultaneously the role of uh, physiotherapist role of psychiatrist role of clinical psychologist role of occupational therapist and simultaneously role, role of a social worker plays a great role as you know in our country the family members in this scenario plays a great role so the psychoeducation to the family members after discharge from the hospital or discharge from the rehabilitation center or else also plays a vital role. So it is a multi-modal approach after the TBI. Second, how we will do the neuropsychological assessment and evaluation, which is generally done by a qualified clinical psychologist. Second, what are the common cognitive deficits, which is most important point? Because after TBI, many times I have seen Many patient has uh, gone to the neurosurgery department or orthopedist department or the PMR department, come to the psychiatry department and after assessment we found patient has some cognitive deficit, but the doctors or the other faculties unable to detect that. If patient has some cognitive deficit, we cannot intervene properly through the patient. That means what we have to do, we will do for the caregiver or to throw the rehabilitation specialist. Why it is important? Because after the traumatic brain injury, two things appears. One is the behavioral problem. Second is the emotional issue. The emotional issue 
because of the injury and simultaneously the emotional issue arises in the family because of the grief or the grief reaction or post traumatic stress disorder because of the injury the family member suffers and simultaneously the patient suffers so we have to evaluate what is the cognitive reserve that is called cognitive reserve of the patient and lastly the multidisciplinary management what i am telling what i will discuss so assessment and management of cognitive and behavioral issues is the priority after the traumatic brain injury first everybody should remember that because the cognitive impairment can impair the post brain injury adaptive functioning so always it is necessary to carefully assess the major neurocognitive functions likewise the behavioral and emotional problems plays a great role following the brain injury when i am telling the just i am explaining why why i am telling the cognitive why i am telling the cognition at least for the those who are the newcomers or those who are the learners generally we assess the cognitive status cognitive status includes the thought of the patient and the most important component of the cognitive function is the attention and concentration that means what is the attention and concentration of the patient that means if we are you are just for example you are telling something or instructing something to the patient whether the patient is able to do or not because of any traumatic brain injury the first thing hampers in a tbi patient that is attention and concentration we have different we have different test for example digit scan test and a trail making test or digit count test or finger tapping test there are many test by which we do this so cognition means for understanding of all is the attention concentration the memory the judgment the thought process the perception and abstract thinking and lastly the orientation of the patient that means if all these parameters combinedly constitute the cognitive functions if these functions are not intact after the tbi when somebody is intervening especially the in the neuro rehabilitation which is the major component of the pmr department they cannot intervene so before intervention all the doctors of the pmr department should know the neuro cognitive status that means they should know the attention concentration of the patient they should know the memory status they should know the judgment status they should know the, uh, the they should know about the arithmetic ability of the patient they should know the abstract thinking abstract thinking means higher function test so these are the things which is required by the multi dimensional by the multi dimensional approach by the team so rehabilitation treatment as i have already told it is a multimodal approach by the neurologist psychiatrist speech language pathologist occupational therapist physiotherapist the trained nurse the clinical psychologist and lastly the rehabilitation specialist or the concerned professionals of the pmr department so first just we will give some we brief about some what are the what do you mean by injury under different types of injury what are the traumatic brain injury as you know most of the time when a patient come to the opd the most common injury generally what happens in the opd either in the surgery opd or neurosurgery opd or any outpatient department when a patient go after a trauma now patient are not patient attendants or the caregivers are directly going to the doctor with a ct scan report and if you will see the ct scan is normal then what is your impression if ct scan is normal after a tbi or you are you just you are guessing patient has a trauma or a road track accident and patient has come to the doctor so what if ct scan is normal or either doctor prescribes or patient has been done ct scan anyway if patient has concussion then the ct scan will be completely normal but the patient is in distress and patient require your consultation so among the types of injury the first is concussion second is contusion third is hemorrhagic injury then open head injury or penetrating trauma then closed head injury and it can be focal or diffuse axonal injury but for our purpose um, we, all the contusion hemorrhage open injury the closed injury and the diffuse axonal injury we can detect in the ct scan or mri or any modern gadgets 
but concussion we cannot detect in the ct scan because in the concussion the ct scan is completely normal that's why it is very vital for us then as the pmr people at least every everybody should know what are the different types what are the different mechanisms of injury as you know i think it is very clear to all of you because by road traffic accident or any any accident there is a acceleration deceleration rotation or shearing movement or coup on counter coup injury laceration or contusion so injury occurs in the counter coup injury the injury occurs at the opposite side due to movement of the brain so these are the mechanisms of the injury then what is secondary injury secondary injury generally occurs after the primary trauma and can result in further damage and as you know all the secondary injury injury we can know from the ct scan and also from the blood investigation secondary injury means we will find cerebral edema cerebral hemorrhage intra increase intracranial pressure hypoxia hypotension hyperthermia electrolyte disturbance which is one of the most important component we can find in the blood investigation and one of the most important thing always after the tbi we try to we try to just to prevent the seizure <laughs> because it is one of the major threat to the patient any seizure activity then subsequent phase there is infection or the vasospasm so these are the secondary injury following the trauma then coming to the most common important thing which just i was discussing what is the characteristics of concussion in concussion if patient is coming to you the patient characteristically you do the ct scan and you find the ct scan is normal so in the concussion the immediate temporary altered or loss of consciousness resulting from the violent blow or motion to the head lasting less than 30 minutes it can happen even if uh, by, by within one minute or in seconds but may or may not report with loss of consciousness so for understanding of all in the concussion there may be a loss or there may not be a loss but in the concussion one of the major issue is headache confusion dizziness and visual and gait disturbance which you can know by examining the patient thoroughly or by examining the patient by by taking some time then memory issues around the time of injury these are certain issues from from the history you can know patient has suffered some concussion which requires your care then what is post concussion syndrome the post concussion syndrome can last for one week to one year after the initial injury but typically improves or resolve by 3 months headache dizziness confusion these are the major complaints simultaneously the hearing loss tinnitus photophobia speech and cognitive deficits irritability poor attention and sleep disorders generally this persist after the concussion so you have to advise the patient about if you will diagnose the case as a case of concussion you should suspect the post concussion syndrome and in this phase one of the most important treatment is rest because brain god has created brain in such a way brain has the capacity to resolve or brain has the capacity to revive so especially the concussion injury after the rest or some after minimal medications patient can improve but what are the parameter you should give the importance that we will discuss later hemorrhagic injury i think it is clear to all of you any injury causing bleeding bleeding into the cns is called hemorrhagic injury hemorrhagic injury may be subdural hematoma or epidural hematoma or intracellular hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage and all these things we can detect investigation by the ct scan this is a just for your understanding i have shown a case of epidural hematoma after the injury you see how there is arterial bleed in the left side there initially it is initially it is lucid then rapidly patient declines there is rapid onset of all these symptoms what i have described headache dizziness gait disturbance all these are there risk of onkal herniation and symptoms are loss of consciousness dilated and non reactive ipsilateral pupil these are the findings you can see very well from the picture there is case there is epidural hematoma then coming to the proper tbi tbi for your purpose can be classified into three types one is mild tbi second is moderate tbi and third is severe tbi in the mild tbi always the loss of consciousness is less than 30 minutes or it can be otherwise the concussion can be included in the mild tbi and as you know 
still now the glasgow coma scale is the golden scale generally it is applied in the all the trauma hospitals of the country not in the country whole throughout the world and in this case in the mild tbi generally the glasgow coma score is from 13 to 15 and there is no ct scan finding 75% of tbi are classified as mild so what i have described especially the concussion and this mild tbi is very much important for all of us because 75% of all tbi are classified as mild what are the then residual symptoms are headache headache is one of the major complaint sleep disturbance for which generally patient come to us vestibular symptoms that means patient has head reeling or gait disturbance memory loss generally anterior memory or retrograde memory loss so these are the findings and because mild tbi constitute around 70% of cases so you should be very careful for these cases and the glasgow coma scale is 13 to 15 then coming to moderate tbi the gcs score is 9 to 12 the loc can be more than 30 minutes and in this case generally we have a ct scan finding and simultaneously there is physical cognitive behavioral symptoms for several months and very few cases it may be permanent so in this case the intervention is required as far as the pmr department is concerned for a long period time by the multimodal approach may have good recovery or long term deficit post concussion symptoms may be extensive then lastly it is severe tbi in severe tbi injuries are combination injuries are combinations of focal and diffuse spread throughout the cortex and brain stem loss of consciousness may be hours or days gcs score is less than 8 the deficits are widespread severe and of long duration so in this case neuro neuro rehabilitation plays a major role for months and years most will be permanent and residual deficit in involving cognition which will be assessed by the psychologist or the psychiatrist shallow speech where the slow role of the speech therapist mobility where the role of the orthopedician or the pmr specialist or blood bladder dysfunction where the role of neurologist or the physician it is required so these are the three types then coming to disorder of consciousness in the disorder of consciousness it is also three types either coma or patient go to the vegetative state or patient has minimally conscious state in case of coma patient have lack of circular cycle on the eeg you can find it in the eeg and uh, in the vegetative state resumption of sleep wave cycle on the eeg no awareness of the environment no purposeful behavior i have seen many cases in our uh, uh, department of uh, in just a nearby to our department there is a regional spinalogy center many patients are there after post traumatic brain injury they are just sleeping in the bed for years and years with the vegetative state after the tbi then minimal conscious state the information of all the glasgow scoring as you know still now it is the golden standard and it should should be applied by all that is eye opening verbal response and the motor response still now it is the golden standard so this is all about the injury then coming to the neuro psychological assessment and evaluation why it is required because as i have already told after the tbi there occurs some cognitive dysfunction and the cognitive dysfunction is first manifested by loss of attention and concentration so the neuropsychological evaluation for tbi is the most common important thing why because the degree of impairment can vary depending on the severity of tbi that is whether it is concussion or mild tbi or it is severe tbi it may be mild moderate or severe the neuropsychological testing is generally done by the clinical psychologist can help to determine the areas of brain that are impacted by tbi and how these impairments are impacting person's daily functioning or person's quality of life more importantly the neuropsychological testing can be determine how other factors that means depression anxiety life stress are important in one's cognitive functioning because i had i have already told after a tbi just imagine the the functioning of the whole family and functioning of the the member which is affected because of the some because of the injury either in the mild or moderate or severe they are simultaneously which, which will discuss later person may suffer from depression because most of the persons after tbi go to the phase of depression or psychosis and simultaneously 
they should have a neuropsychological evaluation to know the neurocognitive status whether patient can be receptive to the therapist or not so what is the purpose of the neuropsychological assessment first we should know the cognitive status what is the cognitive status that means integrity of the cognitive function second to confirm or clarify the diagnosis one unique contribution of the neuropsychological assessment is detection and evaluation of cerebral dysfunction in the absence of clear anatomical evidence of alterations that means without doing ct scan without doing any for example patient is a case, patient is a case of concussion after ct scan we find patient is normal nothing else is there but patient has some impairment as i have already told by doing the by doing the neuropsychological assessment we will find where the patient has the dysfunction where whether it is at the level of memory or whether at the level of attention concentration then after doing this test we should have treatment planning that means recommendation for the cognitive disorders and psychological adjustment including strength and weakness of the rehabilitation educational vocational and other services and determination of the level of cognitive functioning as related to work school and independent living and ultimately quality of life the evaluation can serve to assess readiness to return to work or other important activities such, such as financial management driving after the brain injury or neurological illness such evaluation address whether a person is able by mentally or not that means from the mental as far as mental health is perspective is concerned whether patient is mentally accept men, mentally able to accept the therapist or not this will be this will be done by the neuropsychological assessment and we can know whether patient is able or not then for your uh, this is not required for you just for your reference i have given there are different types of neuropsychological test generally we do that is uh, pgi battery of brain dysfunction aims neuropsychological battery nimans neuropsychological battery wisconsin scat sorting test Luria Nebraska neuropsychological battery, Alstad Retan neuropsychological battery, Wessler memory scale, Stroop color and word test, and another just test which I have just told now about the digit scan test or number letter cancellation test for attention and concentration, trail making test, MMSC, and and Montreal cognitive assessment test or MOCA. Now MMSC and MOCA are uh, just a screening test. all the above test are the test by which we know the complete cognitive function of the patient that means attention concentration visuo spatial memory memory judgment and all the parameters which is required for the normal functioning of the patient that is a complete neuropsychological assessment this is for your just understanding that what are the different tests which exist so how will do the assessment assess assessment that means the assessment plays a major role in the neuro rehabilitation it is centralized evaluation and this neuropsychological assessment has several advantages over bedside mental status testing why because the advantage is it is standardized testing and scoring because it is a well validated scales in uh, with respect to our country for example the ua we are using the aims neuropsychological battery Nimans neuropsychological battery, Scoop test. These these are Indian adaptation scales. Established validity and reliability for most neuropsychological tests with respect to our country and culture. Available normative value for many neuropsychological procedures. So neuropsychological assessment is particularly valuable in patient with subtle cognitive deficit. Subtle cognitive deficit means which I have just mentioned after after concussion. For example, patient is suffering from concussion after one month. Patient is unable to, for example, if a clerk after the injury, he is unable to do his clerical work, or he is unable to write, or for example, a student, he is unable to sit in front of the book. That means the person is suffering from concussion, and subsequently he has impairment at the mild level. That means at the level of attention and concentration. So attention concentration is the first sign which will be hampered if person has the cognitive dysfunction following TBI. Then. first then how will do it the test always don't do the test in the first few weeks why because in the first few weeks the brain is in the phase of recovery so first few week you know the immediate acute stage there should be no evaluation 
changes of patient's neurocognitive status during this stage can occur so rapidly that any detailed information obtained from on the day can be obsolete on the next day because every day brain is changing because god has created brain in such a way after the trauma the brain wants to recover recover and recover and coming to a normal state which is most important in case of a mild tbi or concussion so give some time at least one month post injury we should assess the speed the speed the attention the mental flexibility memory processing speed and reasoning thus apart from indicating severe significant global cognitive dysfunction early administration of comprehensive neuropsychological testing may provide the helpful selective information that same testing would provide later in the patient so the testing should be done after one month because at least one month should be given for the testing of the neuropsychological assessment so these issues are very important as far as patient's ability is concerned because patient ability to comprehend and follow instruction patient competency or guidance whether patient is still in the state of post traumatic amnesia patient ability to retain enough new information to benefit from retaining at the same as the time passes the patient improves and stabilizes and a formal neurocognitive assessment can be conducted to determine the residual strength and weakness and to address other more long term issues such as readiness to return to school or work repeat or serial neuropsychological assessment might be needed because with certain diagnosis such as tbi significant cognitive improvement can be observed over time because as i have already told the brain wants to recover so at especially not at the very short interval at least after 6 month we should do another neuropsychological assessment to know patient with improving or not generally it should be done in every 6 month or one year interval so these are the assessments then coming to what are the cognitive deficits following the brain injury this is most important you see after a tbi after a tbi as i have already told this is very picture this is very clear from this picture either patient have concussion or diffuse axonal injury as i have already told or concussion or patient has focal injury following the peritoneal trauma or patient has subdural or subarachnoid hematoma or intracerebral hematoma so the if patient has a tbi whatever it may be they the you should first know what is the type of injury patient has suffered examples of the neuropsychiatric syndromes associated with neuroanatomical lesion this is one of the most important thing if in the ct scan you will find there is a hemorrhage or injury in the lateral orbital prefrontal cortex the presentation will be irritability mood lability impulsivity and mania like symptom similarly if there is a injury in the anterior cingulate prefrontal cortex there may be apathy or akinetic mutism akinetic mutism means patient will remain mute will not interact or patient will have minimal interaction after some environmental stimuli this happens if there is a injury to the frontal cortex similarly if there is injury to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex patient have poor memory speech or poor set shifting or maintenance similarly the injury most of the time occurs when there is some injury to the lateral part that means the temporal lobe there is memory impairment or psychosis mood lability or aggressive episodes if there is injury in the hypothalamus there is increased sexual behavior or aggression so according to the local localization of the traumatic brain injury this type of symptom occurs so in the initial phase if you will find that patient has the injury in this portion you just imagine you can imagine the course and the prognosis of this behavioral disorders then coming to most important thing which happens after tbi that is post traumatic agitation the post traumatic agitation generally is of type of delirium during post traumatic amnesia typically involves the frontal or temporal lobe it is responsible for inhibition and perseveration excess of one or more behaviors what happens in the post traumatic agitation either aggression or disinhibited behavior that means person will not have some inhibition he will touch somebody touch some elders patient will speak loudly patient will have loud speech in front of all lability lability means patient will cry sometimes and will suddenly cry will stop and will laugh that is called mood lability arousal confusion 
restlessness, irritability, outburst of anger, sensory hyperstimulation. That means when there will be light or sound, suddenly patient will be hyper arousal, distractibility, compulsive behavior, or egocentricity. These are the post-traumatic agitated behaviors. So the cognitive deficits going to the TBI may be coma, confusion, shortened attention span, memory deficits, or deficit in the problem solving skills, as it is very important for students and those who are doing skilled works, decrease awareness of the self and others, loss of sense, time and space, inability to understand the abstract concept. Abstract concept means it is a higher function test. For example, generally how you do the test, we ask some proverb to the patient, either in the regional language or in the higher language, so that you know that the patient has the injury in the frontal lobe. So these are the cognitive deficits. So as far as the cognitive deficits is concerned, we should not always concern the cognitive deficit because it's a multidimensional approach. While we are approaching a patient, we have to see the cognitive deficit, motor deficit, sensory deficit, communication and language deficit, social deficit, regulatory deficit, personality changes, and traumatic epilepsy. All these things, things we have to keep in the mind. The identification, assessment, treatment deficit in language, which is undoubtedly one of the major domains of cognition, can be and often is impaired following the brain injury. So first is, one of the most important thing is attention and processing speed. What is attention and processing speed? I have already told attention is the first thing. Attention more commonly described as concentration or mental focus refers to the ability of the individual to become receptive to the process of incoming stimuli, that is attention. For example, when I am just instructing something, whether the patient is just receiving or not, that is called absent attention. And for any, for any work activities or rehabilitation activities, sustained attention is a requirement for the patient. Impairment in this fundamental cognitive domain are among the most common problems associated with TBI. During the acute phase of brain injury recovery may underlie many other presumed cognitive and behavioral problems. Memory impairment, executive dysfunction, executive dysfunction means higher function. Agitation, irritability may be in fact due to more fundamental problems with the impaired attention. When person concerned will have impaired attention, ultimately because attention is the first step, memory impairment, executive function, agitation, this will remain. Because nothing can be processed. That means any information from outside cannot be processed in the brain. So identification of attentional impairment is an important treatment and consideration of the pharmacological management, especially by the neurostimulant medication, which we will go discuss further, or specific behavioral or compensatory approaches is required. So impaired attention and processing speed have been shown to be prevalent across all levels of injury. Attention is not a unitary construct, but rather comprises different level or aspects. For example, a patient may have a relatively intact focus or selective attention, but manifest difficulty with more complex or higher level of attention that is called sustained attention. Similarly, a patient may fare relatively well in therapy when it is conducted in a private or quiet, quiet room, but may have more difficulty while doing some activity in open area, especially in the hospital, such as therapy gymnasium, where other distractive stimuli are there. Because patient, some patients have a difficulty in the sustained attention, or otherwise it is called divided attention. They face problem by doing something in the hospital. Then coming to next important thing is memory. Memory difficulties are very common in the number of acute neurological disorders like TBI, subarachnoid hemorrhage, hypoxia, stroke, and brain tumor. So it is important to identify overall presence of memory problem, but also to determine the nature of the disorder. That means is a primary memory disorder is present or memory symptoms secondary to another more fundamental deficit. We have to know that. An attentional disorder or executive dysfunction is there. If it is memory problem, is the deficit greater at the level of encoding or storage or at the retrieval? So a careful neuropsychological assessment will conclude what is the problem, whether there is a primary memory problem or secondary memory problem following the TBI. Executive function, executive functions, as I have already told, it is a higher function. The things what we are doing, especially we are doctors or skillful workers. 
eligibility dysfunction though common following TBI, but may elude to access because it covers a wide range of functions like cognitive organization, concept formation, verbal fluency, initiation, self-regulation, planning, judgment, and insight. Because some of the manifestations of eligibility dysfunction are more psychosocial or behavioral than cognitive in nature, they may not be easily captured on formal neuropsychological testing. So, accurately assessing the eligibility function is crucial for successful rehabilitation. As eligibility function are capabilities that allow an individual to adequately engage in the independent, purposeful, or self efficacious behavior. So, executive function is one of the most important thing which we should assess. Similarly, the most critical factor in determining the successful return of the independent function or work. Describe the intact intelligence, memory and attention and ability to demonstrate the gains. In many cases, rehabilitation setting, patient may not so good carry out into the independent setting. Because without accurate assessment of proper management of educational dysfunction, we cannot come to the accurate quality of life of the patient. Thus, a thorough examination of executive functioning should not be restricted to formal neuropsychological testing in a typical structure setting. Assessment should include careful observations of patient behavior, lay structure setting, interview of those who are familiar with patient's pre-morbid personality. Then, visual perception. Sorry. Visual perception regionally include problem with visual construction, visual spatial organization, though not common in TBI, but may be seen in other more focal neurological disorder like stroke. Individual with this visual dysfunction may be able to see things in the field of vision, but have difficulty with higher order perception, including object recognition, facial recognition, unilateral neglect or pathfinding. At the functional level, these problems may affect self-care and other basic activities such as washing, saving, eating utensils, finding one's way around the hospital. So this is one of the most important thing, but is very rarely affected in TBI. Then coming to the behavioral and emotional issues following bail injury. So the behavioral issues are depression, anxiety, disinhibition, impulsivity, aggression, irritability, socially inappropriate behavior, fatigue, restlessness, lack of initiative due to the work, substance as abuse, these are the most common. And as I have already told, after TBI, the depression is very common. The period, the period of prevalence within the first year of TBI is you see such a high amount, 33 to 52 percent. Prevalence of post-stroke depression is from 10 to 60 per 60 percent. Depression not only diminishes the quality of life, but also compromises comprom also compromises outcome of activities in the daily living and the productivity. Depression after TBI is associated with the increased rate of suicide and suicide attempt because of the long-term comorbidities. Lifetime rate of suicide attempters in TBI is four times greater than for the general population. Both biomedical and psychosocial factor contributes for the depression after TBI. The frontal and temporal regions are disproportionately affected in the TBI. In this case, depression is very common. So, Years after TBI, disruption in relationship, vocational instability may contribute to the delay in the onset of depression. So if patient is suffering from depression, what medication will go, we will discuss later. But for your understanding, generally, we should give any selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or any selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Simultaneously, psychotherapy, individual therapy, family therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, Mindfulness cognitive behavior therapy or combined psychotherapy with multidisciplinary rehabilitation and psychological treatment while see greatest benefit in the TBI. So, proactive assessment of hopelessness, suicidal ideation, treatment of depression and substance abuse, close monitoring by family, physicians are recommended following TBI. I will tell how, what other drugs we will give. Similarly, the anxiety is very common after TBI. It is around 2 to 27 percent in TBI and 14 to 28 percent in stroke and similarly the post-traumatic stress disorder the prevalence is approximately 5 to 28 percent. PTSD is seen more often in the mild TBI. Why? Because in mild cases patients have less retrograde and anti-grade amnesia and intact memory. After the TBI because memory loss is not so 
long long so patient have the intrusive recollection of the psychological all the all the traumatic events so awareness of the traumatic event is there so patient may suffer from post traumatic stress disorder anxiety is especially likely to be comorbid with depression and so treatment of depression and anxiety should be done simultaneously anxiety management i will tell later but uh, for your understanding in the anxiety management we should give low dose ssri and benzodiazepines in the initial phase but in the subsequent phase benzodiazepines should be stopped <coughs> cognition of cognitive behavior therapy and pharmacological intervention is the best and simultaneously the psychological management disinhibition aggression and agitation dam especially the damage to the orbito frontal regions of the brain is associated with behavioral disinhibition refer to orbito frontal syndrome or orbito frontal disinhibition syndrome this disinhibition is common in tbi and may increase over first year of tbi it is unfit it is generally examples of disinhibition include unfiltered or offensive speech unwanted sexual talk or advances impulsivity loss of behavior and emotional control so it is found in around 35 to 96% of cases and especially in the present during the acute period and 30 to 70% of chronic phase three syndrome of aggression following tbi include intermittent explosive disorder disinhibition leading to early provoked aggression and temper outburst exacerbation and intermittent explosive disorder involves severe episodic outburst of physical and verbal rage and has been associated with tbi as well as focal epilepsy so management of agitation generally occurs and in the agitation generally what are the drugs generally we give the serotonin dopamine antagonist or dopamine antagonist i will just tell later and the mechanism of action is through increase arousal attention and executive function so in the pharmacotherapy generally in the management of aggression and disinhibition generally we give low dose antipsychotics or anti epileptics or stimulants or beta blockers especially propranolol i will tell generally propranolol is given in the dose of 20 mg bd or 10 mg tds and in the 10 mg bd tds or in the 20 mg bd it to work as a anti anxiety agent or to relieve the restlessness similarly neurotypical antipsychotics i will discuss so chronic use of benzodiazepines is not recommended generally in case of tbi tbi patient why because it will be associated with sedation cognitive impairment paradoxical agitation ssri may be used in some cases if agitation is there psychotherapeutic and psychosocial intervention may help patient to manage the frustrations inhibition and apathy these are also some symptoms which is generally intervened after by giving some dopamine agonist or by stimulants psychosis the prevalence of psychosis after tbi is generally 3 to 26% so risk factors of psychosis are when brain injury is more severe and diffuse and involve the frontal and temporal area and onset of injury is in the early life in that case psychosis is very common so next coming to the most important thing how will you manage especially the management is not a unilateral concept it is a multimodal approach as i have told from the very first initial phase the neuro behavioral cycle of tbi by is itself is a multimodal concept so you have to see the different factors the first factor is whether patient has any pre existing axis one psychiatric disorder or not whether after neuro psychological assessment patient has any cognitive deficit or not whether patient has sleep disturbance whether patient has pre existing personality disorder or patient has any coping mechanism whether patient have seizure whether patient has social or environmental stressor or whether patient have any medical comorbidities like diabetes hypertension or other comorbidities we have to consider that so the in the multi dimensional approach we have to see all the parameters which i have discussed whether it is cognitive deficit motor deficit social deficit or traumatic epilepsy or personality changes so simultaneously pharmacotherapy psychosocial management by the psychologist or occupational therapist and the intervention by the pmr consultants is important and it is a multimodal approach so you generally we use two antipsychotics one is typical group another is atypical in the typical group if patient is delirious generally we use haloperidol 
in the low doses, especially in the dose of 0.5 milligram DD for the delirium. But we use haloperidol in the doses of 1.5 milligram BD or 5 mil or 2.5 milligram BD when patient is suffering from psychosis. Now, a very wonderful drug we have there in the market that is Aripiprazole. It is given in the dose of 5 to 10 milligram per day. And it's a very safe drug and it patient can be maintained with the drugs for a long period of time. Similarly, even the atypical antipsychotics generally you use Qtapin. Qtapin is generally given in the doses of 50 to 200 milligram per day or risperidone generally we give 2 to 4 milligram per day. So these drugs are generally, especially atypical antipsychotics which has less adverse effect, generally we give to combat the agitation, aggression, simultaneously the Qtipin has the additive sleep inducing effect and, ag and aggressive episodes, agitation, all the things are controlled by these antipsychotics. Then to, to prevent the seizure and simultaneously the aggressive episodes, we I have already told, especially in the concussion or either in the mild or moderate or severe TBI, generally prophylactically to prevent the seizure, generally we give the valproate. Valproate is given in the dose of 500 to 1000 milligram per day. Oscar is given, generally given from 600 to 1200 milligram per day. Therintoin generally given because patient may have independent epilepsy before that and it is a wonderful or a golden standard anti-epileptic. Similarly, now levetiracetam is given around 1000 to 200 milligram per day because also levetiracetam is the worst in the sense that it has the propensity to cause psychosis. Similarly, bivaracetam is a new drug. Generally, it is given in the dose of 100 to 400 milligram per day. Dibalprate similarly, 1000 to 200 milligram per day. Clonazepam is one of the best drug as far as acute phase is concerned, but not, not it is a good drug for combat of the, the because it has long half-life, so it is not given in the long run. Similarly, Lorazepam is one of the best drug for acute sleep initiation given in the dose of 1 to 2 milligram per day at night. So, similarly, some other benzodiazepines are there which as the adjunct anti-epileptic action like Globazam. Globazam is the, the given of dose of 10 to 20 milligram. Clonazepam, Dizepam, Nitrazepam and Jolpidin. Jolpidin is a very good drug given to combat to, for, for a good sleep. Similarly, antidepressant, the best drug is Sotalin. We use in the dose of 50 to 100 milligram. Acetylopram in the dose of 10 to 20 milligram per day. Vortioxetin in the dose of 5 to 20 milligram per day. Metazepin is a good drug as far as the sleep if in this conduct concert, given in the dose of 15 to 30 milligram per day. Grupropion is a very good drug if patient has certain addictive potential, especially traumatic brain injury with, can, with the addiction of some uh, uh, these tobaccos. It has a very good drug given in the dose of 1.150 milligram to 300 milligram per day. Similarly, amitriptyline is given in the dose of 25 to 75 milligram per day. So as far as the treatment is concerned, we should avoid benzodiazepines and uh, agent may hasten the neuro recovery that is methylphenidate, dextroamphetamine, dopamine agonist, although it was used regularly previously, now it is very less commonly used. Propranol I have already told. So now I am just describing a case for your, for your understanding. A 70 year old boy was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of six, subsequently has bipolar disorder, conduct disorder, had taken to police and uh, he has uh, uh, frequent fighting, mistreatment with animals, after CT scan showed intraventricular hemolysis and despite seven week intervention by the patient for rehabilitation, he had residual loss of developmental milestones upon discharge. The boy is still in infancy, parents are separated, this is a case, father become custodial and the boy has little contact with the mother since that time. So we assessed the neurocyclical assessment. That means we have done the verbal comprehension index, perceptual reasoning index, working memory, processing speed, and full IQ as 90. So from this scale, we know that because patient has normal IQ, but dysfunction in the neurocyclological assessment. So neuropsychological rehabilitation is required. In the initial phase, we applied the child behavior checklist. From child behavior checklist, <coughs> Sorry. So, patient, because patient is semi-readable, we have given valproate in the dose of 
500 milligram per day. The starting dose is 125 milligram. Subsequently, we have given atomoxetine because patient is suffering from ADHD. <coughs> Sorry. And after the, in the last phase, patient has given, we have given aripiprazole and valproic acid and patient is well maintained. So, so these are the factors generally we consider. So in the summary, lastly, uh, the take home message is depression is usually be treated with the SSRI, Sotalin in combination with psychotherapy and interdisciplinary therapies like CBT or psychosocial therapy, beta blockers and stimulants, valproate or neuroatypicals are useful in treating the orbitofrontal disinhibition or agitation. Diffuse brain injury in the early life increase the risk of psychiatric comorbidities and need for restrictive educational program, slows the trajectory of cognitive development. Mesial frontal apathetic syndrome may improve with dopamine agonist and or stimulant treatment. Risk factor for psychosis include brain injury that is more severe and diffuse, involvement of frontal and temporal area and the onset of injury in the early life. TBI outcome of research are neurocognitive compromise, not emotional or behavioral status plays the most important role in mediating the post-injury. Neuropsychological assessment can serve as an important role in the current specialized and it has centralized evaluation of the neurocognitive status. The depth, breadth and focus of neuropsychological evaluation will depend on the number of factors including phase of the patient recovery, relevant questions to be answered, impairment in the attention are among the most common deficits associated with brain dysfunction, may underlie the other presumed cognitive impairment. Significant memory problems can limit the individual's independence and adversely affect the rehabilitation if not accounted for. Executive function has been shown to be the one of the most important critical factor in the determining the successful post-brain injury return to independent functioning. Depression is most common complication of TBI and stroke and comprises not only quality of life but also functional outcome and complication with the treatment. So this is all about my presentation. Now this is open for discussion. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sarada, for your extensive presentation. Uh, can you uh, minimize your slide, please, or stop uh, sharing this slide? Is it okay? Yes, yes, it is. It's okay. So now the uh, forum is open for discussion. Any question uh, can please uh, put in the chat box so then we can ask to our uh, speaker. Uh, so far, uh, before taking any question from the audience, from the participants, so far is it, there is no question in the chat box. One question from my side that. Uh, uh, it's really difficult for us uh, um, for managing tra traumatic brain injury patients, especially when they are presenting us in uh, confused, agitated states or confused, inappropriate states. They are uh, so abusive in the department and they have so erratic behavior. They start talking, uh, abusing the word. It's difficult to handle them. So how do you think that whether it's the drug only helps in that situation or it is the role of psychiatrist will refer to psychiatrist? Yeah, <clears throat> that, is the that is the most important thing which you have discussed. Especially it is seen that uh, when the person has the injury in the frontal lobe or in the temporal lobe or in the frontotemporal region, then agitation, aggression and psychosis behavior is most common. So in this case, on, unless and otherwise the psychotic behavioral control, behavior, psychotic behavior is not controlled, patients should not be sent to the rehabilitation specialist or the PMA department. So if patient is agitated, you have to give, because previously you were giving haloperidol, because now haloperidol, now there are many better drugs are available, especially risperidol or QTP, which have less adverse effect profile. In addition to that, especially the Patients with uh, agitation, aggression, or disinhibited behavior 
हब जनरली वी आर द मोर स्टेबलाइजिंग एजेंट्स लाइक भालप्रोएट और डाइवालप्रोएट इन एडिशन टू दैट पेशेंट शुड हैव गुड नाइट स्लीप पेशेंट शुड नॉट स्लीप इन द डे टाइम सो फॉर स्लीप वी यूज जनरली लोरेजपम बिकॉज़ लोरेजपम इज वेरी शॉर्ट एक्टिंग सो आफ्टर गिविंग फॉर 15 डेज टाइम जनरली 90% पेशेंट्स आर कंट्रोल बट वी हैव टू थ्री थरोली इफ पेशेंट हैज सीवियर इंजरी और पेशेंट इज कमिंग अंडर कैटेगरी ऑफ मॉडरेट और सीवियर बट बिकॉज़ इन दैट केस we have to taper the antipsychotics otherwise the patient is very prone to develop extra femoral symptom but 75% cases are mild tbi in that case even you can intervene the drugs or you can send the patient to the psychiatrist when the the psychosis behavior is improved at least one neuropsychological assessment should be done the why which area patient has the dysfunction so that your at the your department can intervene yes uh, very often the the scale uh, the scales you have mentioned in your presentation uh, you have uh, mentioned number of scales very often we use here is the many mental uh, mmsc or uh, mm. mental status I, examination i have i have already told because many mental status examination when we were students 20 years back that is that was used as one of the most important scale but nowadays this scale is absolute this is generally used as a screening material for students but for proper yes. neuropsychological assessment it is not used and also the most uh, 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 demerit of this scale is this is not standard it should be actually it should be standardized in the regional language before it's used so what in the, the mmsc scale is not standardized in the regional language and for example i'm just giving one example for example in mmsc you ask the patient uh, whether you have given appointment whether you were given dating this is not in accordance with our culture so the, there are certain things so in the uh, in, uh, in the moka which uh, which scale you will prefer you will suggest for us which uh, for for you for us. you people the moka is one of the better test than mmsc okay fine so uh, right now i can see in chat box one question is kindly elaborate management protocol for cognitive impairment in a case of tbi again the whole presentation you have to present in a very big way that a patient is having some cognitive impairment what is the outlines of management for uh, handling such cases yes actually uh, the question is the, the question is answered um, the answer of the question is whole presentation yes but uh, but for but for the the question which you have asked which you have asked if there is a traumatic brain injury generally the cognitive dysfunction occurs and as i have already mentioned in the moderate and severe cases there is a there is definitive cognitive dysfunction but in case of mild tbi or in the concussion the cognitive dysfunction generally persists for few months so as i have I, as i have already told at least for one month or to two months generally don't do any cognitive assessments because brain has the capacity to revive that means the axons or the dendrons has the capacity to regenerate in that phase so at least the first administration or first test to be done or any neuropsychological assessment done at least after 1 to 2 months and the first sign any any therapist or any doctor can see that is called attention and concentration that is the first thing if it is lost you will know patient has cognitive dysfunction how will you test you just tell the patient we do, do it we just tell it the thing the finger tapping test for example you tell the patient that i will tell many numbers when i will tell five you tap your finger you ask the patient to do you tell 7 2 5 3 because if patient has attention is intact when you will tell five patient will tap this is called finger tapping test similarly digit forward or digit backward test generally you tell some or or and even numbers 2 7 3 9 tell the patient in the forward manner and backward manner a normal person can do 5 5 to 7 forward or 3 to 5 backward if patient has impairment in the attention and concentration he will be have impairment in the digit forward and digit backward test so by doing this simple test you can know that patient has attention and concentration impairment if patient has attention and concentration impairment don't send the patient to any rehabilitation specialist because 
patient will not receptive to the therapist so give some time or send the patient to the psychiatrist after the patient stabilization because 75% of all tbi are mild tbi generally they improve after 6 month so in between this from 1 month to 6 month there should be at least to one or two assessments and when the assessment report is okay then patient should be shown to the shown to you for the proper rehabilitation but many times we receive we receive patients in moderate or severe tbi yes. where this physical component is also is a problem is a spasticity is a challenge contracture is a challenge so unless you handle these things from the beginning stage uh, probably the things will go in a bad way and difficult to manage all these contractures and deformities yes you so are very correct in that situation in that situation patient uh, reports with aggressive behavior along with some physical problems also in that time even uh, in that situation it is not uh, we feel that it's not right to send to only for neuro rehabilitation part or psychiatry part uh, we, we cannot ignore the Uh, the uh, the physical parts also like uh, contractures and spasticity so uh, in that situation we need to handle both the things the his aggressive behavior as well as his physical problems as well yes it is you are you are very correct because as i have to- already told in case of moderate and severe tbi patient have spasticity some medical problems like diabetes or hypertension simultaneously some uh, uh, contracture so in that case if patient is in your custody in the pmr department uh, because and if a patient has agitation or aggression and we will give the drug in the adequate doses in the initial phase patient will have extra pyramidal reaction so in that case although patient is with in your custody the patient care giver should come repeatedly for tapering of the medication by the psychiatrist and simultaneously patient should come patient should consult by the neurologist and for the spasticity or any focal neurological deficits so because as i have already discussed it is a multimodal approach the simultaneous approach is required but patient should not come to the neurologist or psychiatrist repeatedly the caregiver should come for drug stabilization which is one of the best management in with respect to our system and culture okay uh, one more question do you use your patton brooks cognitive scale uh, in your practice please 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 again Uh, somebody has a question sir what about the arden brooks cognitive scale for assessment tbi are you using that scale yes yes for the cognitive assessment as i have already told uh, for your information generally the the uh, which the scales which i have already uh, shown to is or to all of you that is tgi scale nimhans battery ames battery actually to administer one battery it requires 2 to 3 hours generally it is not done by us although it is done by our uh, uh, para professionals like clinical psychologist and even what happens especially in the patient of tbi they ge- don't generally cooperate to complete the complete test in one sitting so in that case we tell the caregiver to bring the patient twice or thrice so that the test will be complete and we will give a impression in the all nimhans battery tgi battery ems battery scoop test what we do generally we just measure all the parameters especially attention concentration for attention concentration there are seven or eight test so the test become concretized visual spatial memory we measure memory we measure judgment we measure generally the abstract thinking you measure so ultimately you give a complete impression in the cognitive function in which area the patient has the dysfunction so that you can determine the patient has dysfunction in this area so this intervention is required for example patient has impairment in the memory so generally if you will just administer something patient will not remember the things if patient has very minimal impairment we do we, we tell advise the patient some cognitive training by the cognitive training especially in mild tbi cases most of the cases especially improve but cognitive training should be taught to the caregiver and simultaneously to the patient if the cognitive status is intact or it is minimal okay uh just i am missing the chat box one question dr saurabh has asked 
when we can taper the drug in a patient with the cognitive impairment when they are in the rehabilitation rehabilitation program uh, dr saurav my answer is uh, because i have already told if patient is agitated patient is in the aggressive phase the patient is psychosis and patient is improving in that case the patient is suffering from psychosis so if patient has complete improvement you will see patient is responding normally <coughs> patient has patient is talking normally for example patients uh, uh, responding normally to normal life and in that case you can taper the drugs very slowly but uh, it requires some training at least at uh, at your level if you can do for example we are giving risperidone to 4 mg to the patient you just do it to 1 mg bd but always remember the circadian rhythm of the patient is very important because what happens generally patient of tbi because they have the no work they generally do sleep in the day time they don't have night time sleep this circadian rhythm generally affect very much to their quality of life and to the cognitive improvement so always advise the patient to take sleep only at night not only at day time and do all types of training in the day time so in your case if patient is talking normally patient has normal activities you can taper the drugs Okay. Uh, once um, uh, Imran Sajid has asked the question, what about the Ardenbrook cognitive scale for assessment of TBI? Actually, Ardenbrook scale, one cognitive scale is there, but in our setting, generally we don't do it. The scale, actually, Ardenbrook cognitive scale is not uh, the standardized in the Indian languages. So generally, the to, what I have already told, especially when I talked about MMSC or MOCA. So the Niemann's battery or the PJ battery or the EMS neurocycle battery, these scales are devised by taking into social and cultural context and standardized in Hindi and certain Indian languages. So you use, use these scales, Adenbrook scale, although they are generally we do, do don't, don't use it especially in our setting. Out of all Indian skills, which skill you prefer is a better one? Especially in our center, we use PGI DVD. PGI DVD is generally divided by the Postgraduate Institute of Research, uh, Chandigarh. And nowadays also you are using AMS battery, which is also divided by AMS. And it is standardized in, uh, standardized in uh, Hindi. So you use it. Okay. So, so far there is... Uh, no questions in the chat box. It's already 8.30, one hour over. So I think uh, we'll have to wind up the program. So uh, before winding up, I must thank uh, Professor Dr. Sarada Swain for giving his valuable time for our students. Uh, hopefully this presentation will be definitely useful for all our uh, PMR specialists and all the PG students. Uh, attending this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Sarada, for sparing your valuable time. We we'll seek your uh, help in uh, future also. Hope you will cooperate us. And uh, I must thank also all the participants whoever have joined uh, this webinar. My special thanks to IAPMR uh, office bearers and office bearers of uh, APMRO, all my staffs of EMR department, and the PMR, uh, the PR team of the IAPMR who is preparing flyer and propagating the uh, webinar in different medium and also this uploading this webinar into the YouTube for the future purpose for the uh, future region of the students. So I thank to everybody whoever have joined this. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.